Welcome, Alexandro. To the, we are all very excited. I just wanted to very quickly say that uh, Alexandro is an expert in in the topic of uh, the connections of epistemic logic and and topology. I would say he's the main worldwide leader on this in this area. So I hope uh, I'm sure it will be a very interesting talk. And we are thank you for accepting, Alexandro. Uh, thank you, Sergio. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy and excited to give this talk. Um, all right, so today um, I chose a kind of combination of topics. Um, there is a large, um, large area of um, research of uh, applications of um, or connections, if you like, between topology and um, epistemology and logic. And I chose two kind of topics that 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 will that are related in my view, and uh, I hope uh, it might be that my slides are a bit too dense for <laughs> too many. On the other hand, I don't have to explain you the topology, uh, the, the topological definitions. That's good, so I can always skip those. Um, I only have to focus on the epistemic logic part. So the talk is called the topology of knowledge, knowing actually, as a process. So. So it refers first to epistemology. Epistemology is, you know, the part of philosophy that deals with knowledge, its sources, and its dynamics, which is learning. And epistemic logic, in particular, is the logical, formal, mathematical study of patterns of reasoning about knowledge. Uh, knowledge is not the only notion that plays a role in, in epistemic logic and epistemology, despite the name epistemic meaning knowledge. Uh, as you'll see, um, belief also plays a role because many times we cannot establish full, absolutely certain knowledge and we try to approximate it uh, by some forms of belief. So the notion of belief, rational, if you like rational belief, justified belief, not just, um, you know, like, not like religious belief or uh, some kind of fashionable belief, but belief based on justifications and rationally formed. Uh, is equally important to, to the one of knowledge in this context. And um, um, moreover, we are interested in justification, justification and formation of beliefs and changing of beliefs uh, that is based on uh, evidence, which means observations or some other form of evidence obtained by communication. But also sometimes uh, this is not enough so the other factor that plays a role in forming the beliefs is what philosophers call a priori, like reasons or principles that uh, kind of allow you to uh, go beyond the evidence and narrow down the possibilities. So these, these are kind of defaults or um, um, postulates, such as, you know, the ones that allow you to do induction, like, you know, assumptions that the world is somehow coherent or uh, uniform, that there are uniform re regularities in it, or assumptions about simplicity, that uh, the, 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 the underlying answers or laws of nature are simple, like in Occam's razor, or assumptions of symmetry and so on. So these are in addition to the evidence. And um, the usual model for epistemic logic, for the logic of knowledge, are the, the so-called Kripke models, Actually, in, in logic, in epistemic logic, they were introduced by Hintika, a philosopher, and then developed by economists, uh, Oman and others, and on the other side by computer scientists, uh, Halpern, Fagin, and others, with applications to um, distributed systems. And the standard model is actually uh, not a topological model. Uh, it's what's called Kripke models, which are essentially models consisting of a set of states with relations between them. And these relations, binary relations, are supposed to model knowledge and belief and so on. Now, these kind of models have been used for a long time and they are very, um, you know, convenient, very simple. They can be well studied. The problem is with that, um, and they are the standard, as I said. However, the problem is that they cannot capture the notion of evidence or these a priori principles that I mentioned earlier. They only can model simple beliefs. And the claim is that topology can do better. Uh, so I'll start with this notion, an epistemic space. So this is just like a topological space, except um, we may want to start a bit more basic than the full topology, namely with a counter -sub countable sub-basis. So we have a set of points, a space S, 
uh, whose po the points of S are usually called states or possible worlds. Um, you'll see why. Together with a countable sub-basis for a topology, which is essentially a countable family of subsets, such that the union is the whole set. Uh, and the intuition is this, that these are the, they are called observable properties, these, these sets, or data. And they represent the evidence that an agent might observe. It's not yet observed, but it could, they are the ones that are in principle, the properties of, of the points, of the worlds, of the states, that can be in principle observed. So they are the potential evidence, right? And we'll be in, uh, you, you'll see that uh, an important role is played by the topology generated by these sub-bases, which I'll call the observational topology, you know, denoted by this tau sub s. Right? So every epistemic space comes from observational topology, which is the topology generated by the data, by this uh, set countable sub-bases. Right? So as I mentioned, the points of the space represent what is called in philosophy possible worlds, and in, um, in computer science, uh, possible states or states. So these are all the possible descriptions of the actual state of the world. Um, well, all the possible descriptions of the state of the world, insofar as we are, uh, the relevant questions are answered, because maybe you are not interested in all the facts about the world, but it is a specific question. So in a given example, it would be like, you know, whether a coin is face uh, heads up or tails down up, or things like that, like it would be not so many possibilities. And also the agent, the underlying agent, the implicit agent, me, the observer, may have some background information. So these are the possible descriptions that are consistent, compatible with the background information. So some may be ruled out, right? So for instance, if I know for sure that the coin li li coin li this coin lies heads up, then I only consider that as the possibility, as the only possible world, because I know it. I, I can exclude the others. If I don't know, I have to consider both possibilities. Now, um, the open sets in this sub basis in O represent, as I mentioned, the potential evidence that the agent has about the world. Has in the sense that um, doesn't yet, didn't yet observe them, this, this evidence, but it may observe, it can observe in the future. So this, this means if the world is, the real world is X, one of the points, then every neighborhood of X, every um, open set in this sub basis that contains X, can be in principle observed in the future, right? So we, ob yeah, we might observe in the future this piece of evidence, and we assume that all observations are truthful. So we only observe a, lot, uh, a piece of evidence when it's true. In other words, if the world really is X, then I will only observe, um, I will only observe uh, these open sub-basic sets that, that, in, that it contain X, that contain the real world, right? Truth in this context means membership. Like the point belongs to the set means that the real world has this property, U. So I only can observe it if it has, if, if it, the world really has the property. So if the property is true in the actual state of the world. Right? So the agent will only observe true evidence. And conversely, we can assume that every such true observable evidence, every true open set in the sub basis, can in principle be observed in the future, sooner or later, sooner or later. Okay, so knowledge. Knowledge is pretty simple in this context because uh, we have only one agent, this implicit agent, the observer, that I didn't name, me. Um, and the proposition is known. A proposition, by the way, is just a set of states, sets of possible words. So it's a subset of the space. P, let's call it proposition. P is a subset of my uh, topological space or epistemic space, and the proposition is known if it is true in all the possible worlds. So in other words, it's the whole space, right? All points belong to it. And I denote this by K of P, is satisfied by this epistemic state space of mine. So in this space, I know P, or the observer knows P, or P is known, if P is true in all the possibilities. Right? Which means the, the worlds in which P is not true have been eliminated somehow. They are not consistent. They are not in our space. Right? So this is knowledge with absolute certainty. Like I'm absolutely certain because right, all of them satisfy P. There is no error. This will differ from belief, as you'll see later, in which there can be error. All right. 
Um, next step is dynamics. So suppose we learn some new piece of information, some true piece of information, which will come in the form of another proposition, A. So another, a set of my state space, a subset, A, is learned, right? And I assume that this is learned for sure. Like I, I learned that A is true, absolutely certain it's a hard information. So what will happen next is that my state space shrinks, right? Because I can eliminate all the st states, all the possibilities that are not compatible with, with what I learned. All the non-A, all the states outside A are eliminated. They are no longer possible anymore because I know therefore they are not the case, right? So I know that the real world belongs to A. So I delete them from my model, from my space, right? Which means this update, this, this form of learning, which is called update in epistemic logic, corresponds to shrinking the possibilities to a, essentially from the original space to a subspace, essentially to a, to a topological subspace given by this. So it's actually an epistemic subspace. Uh, the subbasis that I get uh, on A is consists of the intersection of all the uh, observable properties U in the all subbases with A, right? So the restriction to A. And the uh, resulting generated topology, observation topology, is exactly the subspace topology on the subspace, uh, subset A, right? So what you all know. Right? So I learned A, I, I shrink to, and after that you see that I know A. All right. Um, you see that I did not require that this new, new, new evidence, new proposition A uh, belong, I did not require that it belongs to the to the, my open sets or to my set of observable properties um, script O, right? To my sub-basis. Which means in principle, I can learn something that is not observable, right? If it happens that it is observable, if A belongs to O, then this learning, this update can be interpreted as an observation. So as I really observe some evidence that I, right? And I shrink the state of possibilities to, to that. But in general, I can also learn information that is not, that I cannot directly observe. For instance, A can be communicated to me by some other agent or by, you know, by, by, by other means. Somehow I learned it in an indirect way, uh, but also as a, as a pretty certain thing. So then in that case, A is not an observation, doesn't belong to O, but I can still learn it. I can update with it. So the question is, what, what is the topology playing? What was the role played the topology here? Why did I consider this observational topology, right? I had a set of observable states, of observable properties or sets, but those are just a, a kind of a very minimal condition that they are sets that whose, whose union is the whole state space. So there is no reason necessarily why would I look at the topology generated by them. Well, if you look at it, uh, the sub-basis O intuitively corresponds to the properties of the world that are directly observable that I can directly observe. So they are basic pieces of evidence they can observe. Now, after I observe a number of them, typically finally many, because I, I'm a finite being, so I can, one after the other, I can observe some, say, N possible such evidences. What will I know? I will, I will know that I'm in the intersection of all of them. Okay? So this means that finite intersection of the elements of the base, of the sub-bases, um, constitute also evidence, indirect evidence, if you like, derived evidence, obtained by combining or accumulating finitely many observations, right? So it's pretty clear that, that, that this kind of derived evidence plays a role because I get to know it after a while, after observing the basic pieces. Moreover, uh, unions of such derived pieces of evidence so unions, arbitrary unions, possibly even infinite of such finite intersections, correspond to properties that are properties of the world that are that can also be established based on evidence. Because consider a union A to be a union of such base uh, of such de derived evidence pieces UI, each of them being a finite intersection. Right? This means whenever this property A is true, so if the property really is true in the real world that um, then uh, there exists, yeah, so the X belongs to A, X the real world, then it belongs to one of the UIs. This means there exists one of the I's, one of the, one of the derived evidence, which I will come to know, because I will observe the basic pieces whose intersection is that. So eventually I will come to know this UI, right, based on 
pieces of evidence. And since this, this um, UI is included in A, based on that, I will come to know A, right? I will come to know that A is true. So whenever A is true, every time X, the real world X belongs to A, then A is entailed by some derived piece of evidence that I can actually derive from observations. And that's an if and only if, right? If A is true, then I can find such derived evidence that I can observe, well, in successively pieces, and, uh, and then I infer by entailment A is true because it's included in A. And vice versa, of course, if I observe something that's included in A, then I know that A is true. So, so this, this, um, the open sets in the topology, in observational topology, correspond exactly to the um, properties of the world that are inherently knowable based on evidence. Actually, the technical term is verifiable. Sorry, there is a type of here. Uh, so I want to make it uh, bold face. So these are properties that are verifiable based on evidence. They can be known through observations. So the open set corresponds to verifiable properties. Moreover, even if a property is not open, um, the interior operator, the topological interior operator, um, plays a role here because even if the property A is not open, so in principle it's not very necessarily verifiable based on evidence, it may happen that in a concrete, in a particular world, if the world is a spe special point X, then it is, then it's possible to know A based on evidence. And that is exactly when X belongs to the interior of A. So X belongs to the interior of A, um, right? Which maybe A is not open, so it's not the same as A, but still, whenever the real world X belongs to the interior, this means Right? There exists some open set that is included in A and contains that, um, that point, X. In other words, there exists some verifiable property, and in fact, I can boil down to, because it's a union, right? I can boil down to one of them in the union. So there exists some derived evidence, which means there exists actually finitely many pieces of basic evidence that I can actually observe, and after that, I will know that A is true. And this can happen even if A is not an open set, even if A is principle not verifiable, it's, so to speak, verifiable at X in this particular point, right? Whenever X is in the interior of A, right? So then we, we say that A is knowable in our world X if X belongs to interior of A. And you see this, this corresponds to knowability through observations, what I can come to know by doing finitely many observations in time, right? Through observations. And this notion of knowability actually fits very well with the notion of knowledge that we had before. Because, in fact, you can easily check that knowability is the same as, so something is knowable, in other words, in other words X belongs to interior of A, if and only if property A will become known eventually after observe, making some true observations. So there exists a true piece of evidence, U, in fact, a true, a, a ba Right, so a true derived evidence, if you like, a, a number of true, finitely many uh, pieces of direct, basic true evidence, such that when I observe them all and I collapse them into a big one uh, intersection new, I will know that A is the case, right? So knowability is the same as potential of knowledge, right, as it should be. So something is knowable if I will come to know it after doing some number of uh, observations. And it's captured by interior operator. Um, here are some examples of topology that I don't want to uh, go too much because you, you all know them. Uh, I just want to say that the trivial topology corresponds to essentially epistemically to complete ignorance, like I'll never come to know much except tautologies. Uh, and the discrete topology, so to speak, is the, 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 the topology of God, in which, if you like, everything is observable, um, potential omniscience. Um, here is a more concrete example. A policeman uh, uses a radar to uh, try to determine whether a car is speeding, and the speed limit in this zone is 50 miles per hour. Um, we assume that it's known that the car is moving, but the police doesn't know how fast it's moving, and in principle it can be anything non-zero, every number, every positive number. Of course, <laughs> that's very idealistic, but okay. So the interval zero infinity is the set of possible worlds corresponding to possible speeds. Uh, then the possible uh, observations, the, the sub-basis all consists of open intervals, 
a b with let's say with rational rational uh, margins uh, boundaries so this corresponds to possible measurements by various radars that the police can use with various accuracy as as you know non-zero accuracy but uh, i mean still with some margin of error but any possible um, accuracy so that's actually a base uh, rather a sub base and of course the generic topology is the standard topology and let's consider the property of speeding. Speeding means uh, in this zone that the speed is be strictly bigger than 50 miles per hour, so it's the interval, open interval 50 infinity. And right now, you know, the state space is just the x0 to infinity, so the police doesn't know that the, police, that the car is speeding, because of course there are points in my space that are not in the set S, right? Are in the set X, but not in the speeding zone, right? They are below 50, or even equal. So the, the police doesn't know. On the other hand, let's say it gets a radar with some accuracy, plus or minus 2 uh, miles per hour, and then this shows 51 miles per hour on average. This corresponds to an update. We shrink to a space, subspace, namely the subspace 4953, right, 51 plus or minus 2, open. Uh, it's an open set, it's an observation. So now, um, when we stick speeding to this, speeding, remember, it was everything uh, bigger than 50, sorry. Uh, when I stick speeding to this, I get the interval 50 for 53. And even now you see that the police doesn't, um, doesn't know that the, the car is speeding because my space is actually 49.53. There are points below 50 and points above 50. The police doesn't know. The policeman doesn't know. However, the, he can come to know if he gets even more, um, more a better accuracy for its radar, right? So um, let's relativize the notion of, of knowability to some, something I will call conditional knowability. So suppose you're given some extra piece of information, either observable, proposition A, or unobservable one, because maybe you're communicated by somebody else. So somebody with a better radar, let's say, communicates to a policeman some piece of information A, uh, sorry, um, yeah, A, and then um, maybe uh, a pro our proposition B becomes knowable. So it's knowable given A. So this is the conditional part. Condition on A, B is knowable in a world X. What that can possibly mean, essentially means that when you update, when you shrink to the subspace given by the, the, the learned property A, the updated property A, after that, B is known, in the sense that all points, leftover points, are included in B. Uh, it's, sorry, not known, is knowable. In other words, after I learn A, and I may still need to perform some more observation, then I get to know, I will always get to know this too. So B is knowable after I learn A. Essentially, this is the conditional or relative a, relativization of the interior operator. So it's the interior in the subspace topology on A, right? Interior sub A in this denotes essentially the operator, the relativization to the subspace. So um, the interior in the subspace topology on A. And this is this condition of knowability, the knowability based on some additional unobservable information. All right. Um, so the property car is speeding is in principle verifiable, right? By the policeman. Because if indeed the car is speeding, then, um, then you know, there must be some, some, uh, some uh, point, uh, the real world, that, that actually is above 50. But then by a good enough observation, because this, this, open, this set is open, uh, I will get a better measurement and I can uh, determine. In contrast, non-speeding is, of course, not verifiable in general because it's not open. However, I will say that not, not speeding NS is falsifiable because it's closed, right? So we will see that the, the formal definition is a bit later. All right, so this was essentially my introduction, a bit over time, but um, in the sense that it should have been a bit shorter. So um, now I, the first application is formal learning theory. So learning is about, you know, this process of learning new information. And the goal is to converge to the truth about some, the real world or some question in the long term. In the long term. So that's inductive inference, so-called. 
And inductive inference is, is a famously difficult open problem. I'm talking not about mathematical induction, but induction in empirical science, in which you have to kind of gather data and you try to establish the truth, in, and sometimes you don't have enough information to, um, to, um, to get the full truth uh, with absolute certainty, as you'll see later. All right, here are some definitions. So I'm giving uh, you an epistemic space. A data stream is an infinite sequence of observations from this sub-basis O, right? a sequence of data, and we assume that just um, that they are consistent. So the intersection of all the data that will forever observe in the future is non-empty. This is because we want we are focusing on, on data that are true. So if I will actually observe this in infinite time, one by one, then I observe them, I, I make this true observation. So the real world X has to belong to all of them. A data sequence is just an initial segment of a, such a stream, so it's a finite sequence of, of um, consistent finite sequence of uh, observation. Um, a data stream or sequence is sound with respect to a world X or S. If, it's, if all the observations are true, so if S belongs to all of them, and the data stream is complete with respect to S, the world S, if every observable property of the point S appears in the stream. So everything that in principle is observable and true, every, every set that belongs to O and such that S belongs to it, will be encountered in my data stream. A data stream for a world S, for a point S, is one that is both sound and complete with respect to that world. So essentially a, a, a sound and complete data stream or a data stream for S is an infinite sequence of observations that are all correct or all true, and they are enough together in the infinite time, they give me all the information that it's observable about the all observable truths. And of course, this leads to a succession. If I have a data stream, um, this leads to an infinite succession of updates of subspaces, smaller and smaller. And now recall knowledge, right? So a proposition P is known at some point, right? Suppose I stop at some point in this process of observation at some step n, after I observe a data sequence O0, ON, then P is known if it's known. If, if it's known, conditional in the notion, says that I defined before, on the intersection of all these finally many uh, OIs, right? So in other words, if that, when I relativize to this intersection, when I go to that subspace, P is known. Or if you like, if, the, if P contains, the, includes the intersection, the intersection of all these uh, O0 to N is included in P. Right? So then at that moment, I can say, ha, ah, I know P, given this data sequence. Now, um, P is learnable with certainty in a world S if there exists some sound data sequence, O0 N, so there exists some true, finally many true pieces of evidence, observable, the true at S, such that if I observe them all, all these finally many, then P will become known. So if P is known given that. Right? So it's learnable with certainty when there exists some final piece of your observation that um, P will be known after observing them. This is actually a notion that it's formal epistemology, if you like, um, but actually corresponds to something in uh, computational learning theory that is called finite identifiability. And it's actually is the same, it's the same, except that the way they put it there is that P is finally identifiable at point S if for every data stream for S, every sound and complete stream, there exists some finite stage such that N, such that they depend on the stream, the, the stage, such that the initial data sequence of length N uh, entails P. We can show that these two are equivalent. P is finally identifiable if enough, uh, at a point if enough, if enough P is learnable with certainty at that world. Uh, now, we say that P is verifiable with certainty if it's learnable with certainty in all worlds in which it is true. Right? So it's verifiable when it's, whenever it's true, it's learnable with certainty. P is falsifiable with certainty if its negation is learnable with certainty in all the worlds in which negation is true, in other words, in which P is false. And P is decidable with certainty if it's both verifiable and falsifiable with certainty. This I announced already in the example uh, that I had with the policeman. Maybe I should get up to the policeman before I 
So remember this example. So um, let's see your properties that are um, um, let's see. So here is a property P, which is actually, I think it's exactly speeding, uh, goes from 50, is the open interval 50, I call it S before, anyway, P, uh, from 50 to infinity open, open interval. The policeman doesn't know P with certainty yet, because let's say he observed only 49 to 53, but P is verifiable, sorry, P is verifiable with certainty, because it's an open set. Um, of course, not speeding, x minus p, is actually uh, not verifiable, but it's falsifiable with certainty in the sense that I, I mentioned. And um, there are also properties that are neither verifiable nor falsifiable with certainty, for instance, that the one that are this property, being close to speeding, being, you know, very close to speeding, like just below speeding, like the interval 49, 50 closed, right? Over 50 will be speeding, this is close to speeding. So this is neither verifiable nor falsifiable certainty, which is bad because this means we will never know that it's true or know that it's false based on any accuracy of any rudder. Right? If the speed happens to be in this interval, then we'll never know whether the, the, is, the car is speeding or not for sure. Um, by the way, um, okay, so some topological characterizations, they are pretty trivial, but just to generalize a bit, to, a bit highly than, than just propositions, uh, we are interested in also in solving questions. The question is um, a partition of the state space. So essentially, right, um, the, the, the partition uh, divides the state space in cells, and these are called the answers to my question. So each of the cells are a proposition, uh, and together they exhaust, uh, right? And of course, for each state, for each point S, there exists a correct answer to the question Q at that point, namely the unique cell in the partition that contains that um, that state. A problem is a pair of uh, state space, epistemic spaces, together with such a, a question, a partition over a state space. Now, um, we say that a problem is solvable with certainty, one second, we saw that um, the problem is solvable with certainty. I have some typos here. L should be deleted and instead P should be there. The problem P is solvable with certainty if every answer to the question is learnable with certainty. Right? So this means whatever the answer is in any state, um, whenever I'm given a state and a sound and complete data stream for that state, then there exists some finite stage in the stream in which the correct answer will be known given that finally many observations, right? So that's, um, right, so this means uh, it's solve you'll, you'll know for sure the answer eventually after doing enough observation. In particular, we may consider the ultimate problem. The ultimate problem is the problem that is the most refined, corresponds to the most refined question. Right, the partition, the, the most refined partition, which is singletons, right, points, so if you think of it as a question, the question is, what is the real state of the world? Because the answers are singletons, right? Specific states. Um, and I say the space is learnable with certainty if its ultimate problem is solvable with certainty. In other words, if no matter what the state is of the world, uh, given enough observations uh, uh, along any, any sound and complete data stream, eventually, after some finally many observations, I can I can uh, know for sure the state. So the state, the singleton, is actually an intersection of finally many such observations, and that's for every state. So here are some trivial topological characterizations. They are trivial in quantum, but I mean epistemically they are interesting, but they are kind of modest, both mathematically and philosophically. You'll see why philosophically, mathematically you can see it yourself. So P is learnable. Um, with certainty at a certain state x, as I announced, if x belongs to the interior of p. Um, a world, the world x, is learnable with certainty itself, uh, right? I can learn the, the world itself if x is isolated. Uh, so if it's um, a limit point, it's not uh, learnable, sorry, not learnable. P 
is verifiable with certainty, as I announced, if P is open. It's falsifiable if it's closed. It's decidable with certainty if it's open, of course. And the problem is solvable with certainty if the problem as a partition is open. In other words, all the answers, all the cells of the partition are open and hence open. And the space is learnable with certainty if the observational topology is discrete. Right? So this follows from uh, definitions are pretty easy um, mathematically, but now philosophically where they are trivial, well, because of this. You see that even a property like this, like being close to speeding, uh, so if this is my question, is this, the car close to speeding or not, it's not, um, it's neither verifiable nor falsifiable, it's, it's, never, it's not learnable, right, in this sense that I mentioned, because you can never come to know for sure. And this is typical for most problems in empirical science, like problems in physics, problems in, um, right, because they essentially, uh, you never have enough data, typically, to actually know for sure the answer. So, what we need to do is to go to something less than knowledge, to form beliefs. And here is a way to do it. We introduce a function called a learner. A learner is a function that given any data sequence, any finite sequence of observations coming from my sub-basis over some epistemic space, maps it into a family of sets, of subsets, L, S of O0, N, right? A family of propositions, if you like, that are called beliefs or conjectures. And this family represents all the propositions that the agent, my agent, believes based on this data. So after observing O0, ON, this function tells me what my imaginary agent will conjecture or believe that we true. We'll not know for sure, but we'll conjecture. So the conjecture is actually the properties that belong to this family, the sets that belong to this family. And for, for kind of you know, to make it non-trivial, we respect these learners to respect certain conditions. One, they respect the data. So the intersection of all the observed data, O0 intersected to da, 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 ON, this intersection belongs to the set, to the family of sets, right? So it's one of the, so in particular, after observing uh, these this observations, you believe the intersection. Another thing is, this is very minimalistic, every two beliefs are mutually consistent. So if two sets belong to this family, then the intersection is non-empty. That's a very weak constraint, right? It doesn't assume that all beliefs are mutually consistent. You'll see why I need, I mean, sometimes it's useful to have this. And it doesn't even assume that beliefs are closed under intersection. So you might believe P, you might believe Q, and you might not believe the conjunction. But still the conjunction has to be consistent. In other words, to be non-empty, right? For every two beliefs. And furthermore, beliefs are closed up. So monotonically closed up. So if P belongs to this family and P is including Q, then Q belongs to it. Uh, so essentially this is because you want beliefs to be closed under entailment. If I believe P and Q follows from P, then I want to believe Q. P, Q. Right? So um, given this, um, we say that the learner believes the proposition P after observing or given conditional on some data sequence O0, N, so after observing this, if P belongs to the family that the learner assigned, this output function assigns to O0, N. So, and the above conditions ensure that, you know, conjunctions of observations that you observe is believed, every two beliefs are mutually consistent, beliefs are closed and internal, and actually it follows from them that inconsistencies are never believed, so you never believe the, the empty set. So here are some examples of learners that are interesting in epistemology. One of them is what I call doxastic learners. These are learners whose beliefs really satisfy all the usual postulates for belief in logic. Um, essentially, mathematically, this, the family LS of O0N forms a proper filter of the power set algebra. So it's closed under finite intersections uh, and entailment, and it's proper, so it doesn't, um, is, right? it doesn't contain the empty set. Um, so um, this right, so this strengthens a bit uh, the second clause because it says you actually believe the conjunction of your beliefs, right? Whenever you believe two beliefs, you also believe their conjunction. Um, well, for finally many of them, right? So here is another example that it's not doxastic learner; it's probabilistic learner. Suppose you have a probability measure um, on the state space and the threshold that is bigger than 0.5 
which is a confidence threshold, a number that gives you, you know, confidence. So whenever the probability is bigger than, than that, or let's say bigger or equal than that, uh, then the proposition is believed. Otherwise, it's not believed. Right? So in other words, given observation of O0n, the learner returns the set of all propositions or subsets P whose conditional probability conditional on the intersection of all the data that you observe up to n is bigger or equal to the threshold. Now look at this one. So this is very typical for, for empirical applications, but this is not a doxastic learner. This, the beliefs formed in this way will not be closed under uh, con conjunctions or finite intersections and will not even be uh, globally consistent, right? They, they, they are not closed, right? So they're, they're, they're the intersection of all the beliefs in this family might be empty. Nevertheless, they will satisfy my conditions here because um, there will still be the case that uh, for any two beliefs or probabilities bigger than equal, bigger or there's some threshold bigger than 0.5, their intersection will be non-empty. So they are mutually consistent. Although you might not believe the intersection, but they are mutually consistent. So that's one reason to have these mild conditions is to allow probabilistic learners. All right, um, here is standard learners. Standard learners are super logical. They are doxastic learners that are close, whose beliefs are closed not only under finite intersection, but under arbitrary intersection. So essentially, it's a principle, the family of sets is a principle filter. So there is a strongest belief there is the intersection of all the beliefs. So in other words, we can describe this learner very simply by, by assigning to O0n a set, an actual non-empty set, uh, different than the script LS, which is a family of sets. This is one set represents the strongest belief or the conjecture, the main conjecture of our believer given O0n. And the family of beliefs is just consists of all the P's that include this set, right? It's the principal filter generated by it. So uh, there's a corresponding standard learners in this kind of uh, unique set functions for each set of obs uh, finally many observations, you get a, a non-empty set. So these are super logical learners that are or always can combine all their beliefs into one. And um, standard are standard, if you like, in learning theory. Um, here is another uh, example, what I call AGM learners from a famous, uh, famous uh, logicians um, that um, essentially prescribe some axioms for, for the theory of belief revision. Let's, I will not deal into that. So these are well-behaved learners, okay? Uh, they are doxastic learners that are particularly well-behaved, although they are not necessarily standard. Um, and they have a kind of principle for their beliefs. They are kind of justified belief in some sense. Such learners start with a prior relation. So they put first a, a total preorder on the state space. You can think of this as a plausibility relation. It says some possible worlds are more or equal, plausi more plausible or strictly or less strictly or more or equal uh, than others, right? So something is less, at least as plausible as others or strictly more plausible. So they make this and they is required to be a preorder, as a reflexive attribute and total. Every two worlds are comparable, right? So they start with this plausibility order, which is a priori, is the is end of their prior belief, so to speak, based on whatever you like, some kind of a priori postulate or defaults, or so this is where the a priori comes into, into play, right? Some kind of whatever, simplicity postulates or whatever. And, um, and then when they observe data, O0n, uh, this learner will believe a proposition if and only if this proposition is is true in all the states that are left over, that are compatible with the evidence, they belong to the intersection, that are high enough in this order, that are plausible enough. Right? So in other words, P belongs to this uh, set, P is believed, if and only if there exists a state in the intersection, such that all the states in the intersection that are above or equal to it belong to P. So, so P is true in all the plausible, plausible enough states. Okay. All right. By the way, we can also look at um, AGM learners that are standard. In other words, uh, they form a, 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 a principal filter. So those will be simpler because then we can boil down to one, one belief from which everything follows. Uh, and then this definition can be simplified because plausible enough means most plausible. 
So it can be replaced by, by most plugin. So in other words, um, a standard AGM learner will correspond to um, a function that assigns this particular set to each um, a finite sequence of data, finite data stream, you take the intersection of all the data and you take the maximum of it with respect to the order, the given pre-order. Right? So you take the most plausible states and you believe that and everything that follows from that, of course. So that's your generator for the principal filter. That's your strongest belief. The that consists of the most plausible states. So in other words, a standard AGM le learner believes something when that something is consistent with the data and it's true in all the most plausible worlds consistent with the data. By the way, that's one of the interpretations of AGM learners is this plausibility relation. There's another interpretation which I kind of announced already in terms of simplicity. If you think that this order that they put, they put in the virtue of thinking that some possible, some alternatives, some theories, some explanation of the universe, some states are simpler, uh, than others, then the maximum, of course, corresponds to the simplest possible um, states or theories of the world that are consistent with the data, with observations. So essentially, forming beliefs in this way is an instance, it's a formalization of Occam's razor, if you believe, if you accept this interpretation. All right. So now let's go back to our problem. So we are, we are, we want to deal with situations in which it's not possible to know for sure ever. Uh, the answer to some empirical question uh, based only on observations. But now we have a way to go beyond observations via these learners that form beliefs. So then we want to say in what, way, in what sense they can still converge to the truth, to the true answer to a question or to the, to the truth of some proposition. So given a data stream, an infinite data stream, um, the learner, so given a learner and given a data stream, we say that eventually believes the proposition P on the stream if there exists a finite stage in the stream such that from then on, forever after, the learner believes P. Right? Believe starts to believe P and will believe P after uh, any further observation in, the, in this data stream. Right? So in other words, P belongs to L to LS of O0M o, o for every M bigger than L. So you yeah? So this is a specific def definition specific to a specific data stream. So like a way to, to observe things. Now we want to quantify over all possible states and over all possible ways to observe truthful information. So we say the learner tracks the truth of a, propo of a proposition P. If for every state and every data stream that sound and complete at that state, uh, P is true at that state if and only if the learner eventually believes P on that data stream. So in other words, right, it tracks the truth if it tracks the truth. If, right, the P is true if and only if the, the, the learner will eventually believe it, no matter what true information, as long as he does, gets enough true information, um, uh, true observations, enough many, then he will eventually believe it and stay with his belief. And of course, there is a dual, um, he will not know it for sure, but he will believe it forever in a stable manner, and nothing that you will ever observe will disprove it. There's a dual notion for tracking the falsehood, right? So tracking the falsehood of P, if for every state S and every data stream that's complete on uh, uh, S, P is false at S, even only if L, S eventually believes the negation of P on that, on that stream of observation. All right. So I say the proposition P is inductively verifiable by a learner if the learner tracks the truth of this proposition is inductively falsifiable by the learner if the learner tracks the falsehood of the position. And P is inductively decidable if it's uh, both inductively verifiable and inductively falsifiable by the learner. And this is for a specific learner, and now I'll quantify over the learners themselves. I say a proposition is inductively verifiable or falsifiable or decidable if it's inductively verifiable, falsifiable, decidable by some learner. So it's an existential quantifier. So if there exists a learner that tracks the truth of P or its falsehood or both, then I say the proposition is inductively verifiable. So in other words, now I, I say, look, not all no learners are equal. Maybe some learners are stupid. But the proposition is in, in principle learnable. It's inductively verifiable. If there exists some learner that knows, I mean, 
Forms believes in smart enough ways such that uh, P is true if and only if the learner would track it's true. P is false if and only if it, uh, P, uh, the learn that learner will track its falsehood and so on. So, um, so the properties that I mentioned earlier, all of them are actually inductively verifiable, inductively verifiable, and inductively falsifiable. They are actually inductively decidable. Speeding, not speeding, are now actually in this sense they are learnable. Um, even if one of them was not for, not verifiable and so on, now you can uh, inductively verify them, not verify them with certainty, but inductively, because you can converge to the true to a, to a true, true belief about it. So, for instance, this is a learner that I form. I gave you here a, a learner, a function that will inductively decide whether p is true or not, whether the car is speeding or not, not with certainty. He will never be sure, but. Um, eventually he will always get it right after a number of finite observation. So essentially this is the good cop, the good cop uh, learner. He assumes you are innocent until proven guilty. So starts with a belief in, in, um, in innocence as long as it's possible, as long as the data doesn't show you that you're guilty, that you're spinning. So there are points consistent with the data that, uh, that are uh, consistent with not spinning, then he believes not spinning. That's his strongest belief. Um, it's a standard learner, so it has a strongest belief. And when the data shows it's speeding, so when the data, uh, the data actually implies the intersection of all this data entails speeding, then he will believe speeding. And he believe the data, of course, but that implies speeding. So we'll, we'll change his mind at most once and stay forever there. So this one always gets it right eventually and stays with the right belief. But of course, other properties now are also inductively decidable. For instance, the property of being close to speeding and now is inductively decidable, both inductively verifiable and inductively falsifiable, and by the same learner, although it was not verifiable nor falsifiable with certain. So, um, and I gave that here, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I will skip this and leave you the slides later, um, send you the slide. I constructed here a learner, I hope it's uh, <laughs> correct, that these details I haven't checked, that inductively decides uh, whether the car is being close to speeding or not. So this one will have at most two reversals or opinion. At most two, not one like in the previous case. But will eventually settle on the right belief, close to speeding or not close to speeding, and stay there forever, no matter what the, I mean, as long as right, the, the true data keep uh, coming in. Okay, so now we get back to, from propositions to problems or questions, right? So problem, remember, it's a partition of a, st and a, a given state space together with a partition. I said that the learner L inductively solves a problem if the learner can inductively decide every answer to the question. Right? So all the possible, right? whatever the true answer is, he will eventually uh, track the truth of that answer and falsify the others. Right? So track the truth of them. So after getting enough data, we'll converge to the, to, 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 uh, the true belief in the true answer, whichever it is, to the question, the true self. And again, I quantify existentially over learners. So inductive problem is inductively solvable. If there exists some learner that can inductively solve it. All right. Finally, uh, I boil down to the spe special case of um, spaces, uh, like learnable spaces, in other words, to the ultimate question. So the, suppose I set this question, which is the ultimate question, the most refined partition, consider of singletons or the question, what is the real state of the world? And I apply the notion that I just defined to this particular uh, most refined ultimate problem. So then I say, I say that the space itself is inductively learnable by a learner L if L inductively solves its ultimate problems. In other words, after given, um, if given infinite amount uh, data, observable data from O, eventually, the learner settles on the belief in the true state, in exactly the, the, the singleton considered the true state. He may never know that that is the actual world for sure, but he actually uh, believes it and correctly and forever. Right? That's enough for doing empirical science, right? You want, in physics, you want to converge the true theory. You might never know for sure that it's true, but as long as it is true and you're justified to believe in it and you're right and you'll stay like that, then you got the final theory of the universe. So um, that's the inductive learnability.
Here are some examples. This is the state space. Uh, I draw here by ellipsis the uh, observer properties. The points are the worlds. Uh, that is uh, not learnable with certainty, but is inductively learnable. Right? So you, you mean, um, right? So suppose the state is S1. You observe only true, true observations now. So ellipses that contain the state S1. Uh, P1 or P2 in random order, you know, yeah, and eventually you observe all of them, but in infinite time because there are infinitely many here. But you don't observe P0 because that's wrong. Suppose, assuming that the state is S1, then you cannot observe P0. Now, you'll never know for sure that the state is S1 because it might be a zero. You don't know at any given moment that tomorrow you might observe P0. You don't know that. You cannot tell the future. So, that which, which will rule out S1. So you can never be sure that the world is S1, but you can form belief in such a way that you converge to the right one, whichever it is, in this particular case, S1. And the learner is very simple, namely, for any given observations, takes the intersection of them, let's say some ellipses here, and believes the world that is uh, the, the highest number inside the ellipses. Right? That's the most plausible world. So actually, you can see that this is an AGM learner because it puts a plausibility order that makes higher numbers more plausible than lower numbers. And after learning some observations, say P2, that excludes S3, S4, then believes the most plausible one, which is S2. And eventually, will settle on the right one, whichever it is. Right? In the sense that we'll believe in the right one. Here is a non-learnable space, that's a space with uh, infinitely many points, S0, S2, S3, and the point in, at infinity. And ellipses uh, are like this, and they describe the, um, um, the observer properties, and you can check that this is not even inductively learnable. You may never know. There is no way to form beliefs. There is no learning function. There is no learner in the sense of function that will systematically ensure that whichever the point really is, some random point is, the actual world, will converge to beliefs uh, into that one and not to the wrong ones, um, and stay there by observing ellipses. All right, here are some results. Um, well, these are easy, let's uh, skip them. Here are some notions. So there's a notion of constructibility in topology, a set is known to be con uh, called constructible if it's a finite union of locally closed sets, where a locally closed set is one that is an intersection of an open and a closed set. I extend this notion, because I haven't si find this notion in the literature, to something called omega constructible. So omega constructible is a set it's a countable or finite union of locally closed sets. Um, it can, um, a question to partition is locally closed if all its answers are locally closed, all the cells. It's omega constructible if all its answers are omega constructible. And it's countable, the question, if it has countably many answers. It's a countable partition. Given these definitions, a proposition P is inductively verifiable, you can prove, if and only if P is omega constructive. It's a countable union of locally closed sets. It's inductively decidable if both P and S minus P are omega constructible. A problem, like a question, a partition, is inductively solvable if the if the partition, the question is countable and omega constructible, and every answer is omega constructible. In other words, it can be refined, divided up into a subpartition that is a countable locally closed one. And applying this to learnability, a space is inductively learnable. In other words, the ultimate question is inductively solved. If the space is countable, has countable points, and it's TD, which TD is a separation axiom that essentially says um, every singleton X is locally closed. is an intersection of an open and closed set. It's one of standard separation action. All right, so given all these um, topological characterizations, which are um, not very easy, are much harder than the previous ones, but um, um, not very hard either, uh, they can be used to prove some uh, harder results. And this is the main result in this part of the talk, um, so, essentially, I say it in words and I explain what it means, AGM learning, this learning by putting a plausibility order to start with, a smart one, you choose a plausibility order in a good way, uh, given the space, you're given the, the space and the open sets, you put an order, a pre-order, and then you believe whatever uh, is, you know, 
very plausible, plausible enough, high enough in this pre-order among the, the points that are consistent with the data. It's also what I call Occam's razor, right? It's a universal inductive problem solving method. This means every problem that is inductively solvable by any learner, by any learner function whatsoever, if there exists a learner that solves it, then it can be solved by a learner that applies this method, starts with this plausibility or simplicity order and does it like that. Right? And it's a constructive theorem because it actually construct well constructive modular axiom of choice in some cases. Uh, um, uh, but um, yeah, it's uh, it actually proceeds by constructing the pre-order, the plausibility or simplicity order from the topology. And the proof is non-trivial, it uses a generalization of stratification methods from algebraic uh, geometry. Uh, so, and this has philosophical importance, because it says in a sense, this kind of learners, if you like, rational belief formation, according to its plausibility order, or if you like, rational um, Occam razor uh, believers, can solve every empirical problem that is solvable at all. Not everything is solvable, I showed you a counterexample earlier, but if, if there is a, a solution, there is a way to learn it inductively, uh, to form con con correct beliefs in the end, uh, in eventually, then this one does it for you. You don't need the others. And as a special case, you get a slightly, this was proven before, also by us, but uh, slightly easier to prove special case that you apply to the ultimate question, uh, the one the singletons, uh, and then this says AGM condition of Occam Razor is a universal inductive space learning method. So in other words, every inductively learnable space, every space whose ultimate question is learnable, can be inductively learned by this method, by Occam's Razor slash AGM. So that's a main result in this area, um, and comes with some prices, the AGM, um, the AGM um, uh, kind of method uh, can be shown to not always be standard, which means essentially the intersection of all your beliefs might not be believed. In fact, the intersection of all your beliefs, infinitely many, might actually be empty. Although the intersection of every two of them or infinitely many of them is, is not empty. Um, so that's a kind of global externalist meta inconsistency, so to speak. Something like a lottery paradox, uh, if you've heard of it, in which yeah, the price for universality, the price for always converge to a truth is that you form beliefs that converge to a truth, but occasionally they are at a global level mutually inconsistent. Similarly to the probabilistic case, this is not a probabilistic method. There are similar results for the probabilistic um, learner. Also, it's also universal. But uh, the price in both cases is that the probabilistic learner can, and the GM learner cannot, be, cannot always be assumed to be standard. In other words, does not believe the conjunction of all his beliefs and cannot even be assumed to be globally consistent. So, you know, the finite intersection of any of your beliefs is, is consistent, but globally they might not be. Although eventually they are, because eventually you your beliefs converge to a true, the true world or the true answer, right? And that is consistent. But in between, at some moments, the price might be that you make it inconsistent. Okay. And, uh, so uh, my presentation is the second part, but I, I, I was too ambitious anyway. I know something about uh, surprise exam, a famous paradox. I will, uh, I will probably send you the slides. Um, uh, so there is a, uh, a second part that deals with epistemic paradoxes and connects them to Cantor derivative and uh, uh, the so-called perfect core of a set and the Cantor Bendixson approximation process of the perfect core. Um, so, in this part, I only I only showed you the epistemic interpretations of interior and closure, and of these well constructible sets and so on. But the, I only use these notions and locally closed, but not the, the not the derivative. Um, essentially, the derivative have to do with unknowability of the real world. When the real world is not knowable, not even when you're given extra information. So it's like I announce you in advance. Look, you'll never get to know the real point. I draw a point, right? and you are allowed to do measurements. You'll never be able to determine the exact position of this point, no matter how accurate is your measurements. And I'm even giving you extra additional background information, like I, re I, I, I shrink to a, some subset of the real line, uh, and you still cannot know it. And I'm telling you this. And um, 
And if this is true, then you're then the derivative, the point belongs to the derivative of the set representing the, the extra background information, eh? the counter derivative. Uh, and if this is true, even after I'm telling you all this, then the point belongs to the perfect core obtained by the counter bedding. So process of iterating counter derivative only, until you uh, reach a fixed point. So this is like a self-referential version. That's why it's connected to paradoxes. Uh, in which I'm telling you something, I'm telling you, you will never know the position of a point. Um, yeah, I should give the example here. Finish with that. Right, so I have a, a set A of uh, points on the real line, consist of zero, one over n, and points of the form one over n for plus any power of one over m. N, and the points in one, two, something like that. And I'm telling you that um, I'm the teacher. I'm telling you, you will, um, you will never know, no matter how accurate measurements you do, the position of this point, even after I'm telling you that it belongs to A. Uh, if that's the case, if I'm right, then it's not just that you will never know, you'll also never know after I'm told you, <laughs> I've told you so. So in other words, you, right? So in other words, um, you're in a fixed point of this never knowing. You're in the fixed point of the counter derivative applied to this set. And if you apply the counter derivative to a set repeatedly to get uh, the, the perfect uh, subset, the perfect core, you get to the set uh, one, two. That's the perfect core of it. So if the point really belongs to one, two, then you will never know, even after I'm telling you that you will never know, right? The position of the point, and no matter how good a ruler you have. Um, so that's kind of solves a bunch of epistemic paradoxes, which people thought they are paradoxes because they didn't have the right mathematical tools, uh, known under the name of surprise examination paradoxes. Um, the, the example is more mundane, it's not to the real numbers, of course, but, but, uh, um, but that's the, the core of the solution. And uh, we also developed a logic for this that uh, axiomatizes notions of uh, histological notions and uh, pro gives a, a kind of um, complete and sound uh, formal system for this uh, counter derivative operator in the perfect core. Okay, so I want to end here and uh, yeah. Sorry for being over time. Well, uh, uh, t thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Alexander, uh, Alexandru. Um, so does uh, anyone has a question for, uh, the speaker. Uh, there is a comment in the chat. Uh, nice. Thank you. Some people You're welcome. <laughs> thanking you. <laughs> uh, um, well, just uh, well, I just have a very um, simple question. I think uh, is. Uh, well, this this all of this sounds really interesting and and, and impressive. How do you manage to put in, in mathematical terms or all, all of these concepts? And uh, and and I was I was wondering if because you're working with topological spaces, I was wondering if it is possible to give an interpretation to continuous functions in this context of observations. Uh, and, yes. Yes, yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah, this is a very good question. I am actually, I didn't prepare very well, as you can see, my talk, because I actually combined two different talks from different, um, and I didn't succeed to, to wrap it up in a, in, a, in a smaller number of slides. And this oh. was more mainly due to the fact that I'm under a deadline to finish a paper by now. Um, I oh. gave many talks on this other paper with Johan van Bentham on exactly this, this, this issue. So, um, so uh, the notions of learning that I considered here are learning of answers to questions that are in a sense propositional. Like question is, the answers come as proposition or sets of words, like you know, something is true or not. Now, a question can also be a, a what question or um, rather than an if or that question. So it's like, instead of the answer being a proposition, the answer can be a number or a value, right? What mm -hmm. is the position of this point? And I want oh. the actual number. What is the... The, the length of a thing. So these are questions that are um, essentially are, are called variables, empirical variables in, in, uh, 
epistemology, and they correspond to everything that you see mostly in physics and, and social sciences. Yeah, no? So mm -hmm. measurable properties of the world, right? And um, when you want to observe, you don't observe just a proposition. You don't observe something that, uh, you know, you observe some values, right? And, mm -hmm. those, and those observations come with an imprecision. So in other words, the values come with their own topology. So, uh, uh, right? So, yeah. so the, the question in that sense is, a, or the empirical variable is a function from the state space to some topological space, right? Some space of values, right? So it returns the correct answer, the full answer only known to God, like the precise position of this point may be a number, a real number. But the observable answers are intervals, right? Some kind of, so the, the set of answers, the domain of, the, the codomain of this function correspond, comes with a, with a, with a topology, right? The given that, that essentially reflects what I can observe in principle. Mm -hmm. And now the, the, the issue is that you want to study dependence between questions, right? Because sometimes you cannot directly observe the answer to some questions. You cannot directly, some values, some variables in physics are not directly observable. You directly observe others and you want to know based on some a priori assumptions, like for instance, Newton's law or relativity, some laws that govern the connection. You want to know whether you can come to know, or at least to, inductively know, like I said earlier, like kind of to approximate good enough the value of a variable y given enough information about the variable of, um, the value of variable x, right? Uh -huh. And this enough is like, I want, to, I want to be able to get arbitrary, uh, non zero, but arbitrary precision I like on y if somebody gives me enough precision on x, right? Gives me enough data on x in the infinite time, I keep measuring x. Mm -hmm. And this kind of dependence exactly corresponds to continuity of the, right, the existence of a function that maps actually uh, x into y, right, uh, like compo composed with x, it gives you y, and it's um, in the underlying topologies of the two, of the two questions is continuous as a function from the two spaces, right? And, and that's, that's a special case. Uh, right? And then, uh, so we study actually axiomatize this logic of, uh, kind of learnability in the sense of continuity. Um, and then we notice that in fact, uniform continuity also may play a role because it gives you a stronger notion of no knowability in which you want to say not only that I can in principle determine what I said earlier, uh, Y given X with any arbitrary precision, but I, somebody gives me a deadline or uh, 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 I say, uh, ask me, okay, what kind of radar, what kind of instrument you need to use on Y in order to determine X, right? If I want to s find X with 0.5 precision, what kind of, because maybe I need a better radar, more than 0.5 for, for the other one, for X. But if I can tell him, yes, I need exactly that, right, in advance. So I kind of put a bound on the, on the steps, inductive step steps of, say, um, getting better and better uh, precision uh, on the other side. Uh, ahead of time, then this corresponds to uniform continuity of the of the underlying function within the variables, right? Mm -hmm. So uniform continuity con corresponds essentially to a stronger notion of knowability in this context. And in fact, there are many other knowability uh, uh, notions that um, correspond to a uh, whole hierarchy, some of which are not even explored topologically in the sense I didn't find the right topological notion. I mean, it's clearly topology, but I didn't find it in the lit topological literature. So they kind of open in a sense of like, what is the natural, I, I have a characterization, but I don't know what, for even stronger notions of knowability. So they correspond to a hierarchy of functions that are of dependencies that um, give you notions of, um, of, of learnability. So very I good see. question, thank you. Yeah, well, impressive, an impressive answer. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised. Okay. To